Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Arlington and I hope that when you leave today you have an opportunity to get outside. Uh, we do not plan to keep you long but we do want to uh, gain insight from you today on solutions for polystyrene in the waste stream. Uh, a number of you are here because you're passionate about the environment, you're passionate about research and development, uh, interested in changing social dynamics so that people will better appreciate the environment and uh, be better stewards. And then certainly um, from the area of what we can do within government and legislation, bringing forth those ideas so that we can get community support. Because really, at the basis of this, community support is what's going to change the way people shop, or rather the way that they dispose of um, their waste. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about polystyrene in the waste stream. Then we're going to talk a little bit about polystyrene not in the waste stream. Then we'll uh, touch on the potential and the future. And then I'll invite all of you to ask some questions. And what's probably going to happen is you're going to offer some insight. And we welcome you to do that. We don't want to keep you long, but we certainly hope that you'll stay to break bread with us and enjoy um, some good community conversation. Uh, my name is Miriam Gennari. Uh, I come to this uh, under the title of Styrofoam Mom. Many of you have heard me lecture on the subject, but lecturing is not what we need right now, which is why I brought together a fantastic team. Uh, I want to thank uh, Arlington Independent Media for being here today to, uh, to, to take a, a video of this um, presentation. And then, of course, um, I'll, you'll see some of our other presenters as well. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael Ranga. Uh, Michael Ranga is the business manager for Covanta's Waste to Energy plant. Uh, their plant serves Washington, D.C., Maryland, and definitely Virginia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Ranga. I'm a business manager with Covanta Energy, located in Alexandria, but services Alexandria and Arlington, and as Mary mentioned, some of the greater areas in D.C. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Miriam for a few years now, first when she ran as a Green Party candidate for the school board and was successful in getting the styrofoam trays uh, out of the Arlington County uh, school system, which was a big uh, plus. She also is very intuitive and uh, got an inquisitive mind. She came to the waste energy facility wanting to know more about it, like, what do you do with trash? For us, waste is a valuable resource. And if you exhausted all those efforts and you have to dispose of something, rather than it being wasted away in a landfill, we provide it, uh, a conversion technology to make energy out of it. Uh, we've been doing it for 25 years uh, in Alexandria, and like I said, we serve both communities here. Uh, the way we do it is actually combustion technology. So it's just like an internal combustion engine in your car that puts out carbon into the atmosphere. So we do put out carbon into the atmosphere, but we also offset methane, which is the big greenhouse gas polluter for the environment when trash decomposes in a landfill. If it happens to be thrown out, we convert that into electricity instantaneously at our furnace temperatures. But it is better to get it out of the, out of the waste stream if it can be recycled and reused. And that's the goal here today, is to explore ways and how we can do that. There should be proper business incentives, uh, co cooperation between industry and government would be a, a, a great win. Now, Covanta, uh, basically, we take whatever is thrown away that's not recycled, comes to us, we're called a mass burn facility. So if there does happen to be things that could be recycled, we don't hand sort through them and try to get them out. Um, our furnace temperatures are 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, that is, that most organics are destroyed and is converted into ash. Um, the way we create electricity is it's surrounded by uh, steel tubes or a water wall furnace. So we're converting water into steam and that uh, hot steam is spinning a turbine generator like electricity. Uh, it's pretty efficient. We only consume 15 percent of the energy to run the plant, which is all the motors, the fans, and uh, 85 percent is sold to the local grid to Dominion Power, which is enough power for about 20,000 homes. Uh, because the, the chemical components of styrofoam is carbon, you know, we are uh, regulated for CO emissions, carbon monoxide, which is a product of incomplete combustion. Again, you get that out of the waste stream, 
uh, then that's better for us. We don't have to worry about our CO emissions. CO2 is also another uh, greenhouse gas that's a problem that uh, is being regulated for large power plants. The facility here locally is smaller, so we don't have a CO2 uh, regulation, but that is coming down the line. So anything we can do to help the environment get these harmful products out of the waste stream or reuse is, is better for everybody. Um, some of the things we do for environmental control, so we're not just an incinerator that has billowing black smoke coming out the top, we do have uh, air pollution control technology. The first is uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, NOx control, nitrogen oxides. Uh, that is also a greenhouse gas problem. You inject uh, ammonia into the, the flue gases, into the boilers, I should say, uh, through a selective non-catalytic reduction process, and that prevents the formation of NOx compounds. Secondly is uh, uh, acid gas control. So a lot of the plastics, for example, polyvinyl chlorides form hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Those things acid, is an acid gas problem. We have to scrub the flue gases with lime. And then we also have carbon injection for uh, heavy metal control. Uh, that's uh, persistent in the environment. And last but not least is a baghouse technology to capture the dust. So all steps of that process have been in place for a while to clean up the flue gases. Um, one of the benefits of what we do is actually recycling post-combustion. Uh, when people throw out metals, for example, like uh, mufflers, old pots and pans, bicycle change, at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that doesn't vaporize or melt. So that comes out our, the back end with our ash product. We have a huge magnet to collect the material and recycle that. I think so Miriam was excited about that kind of opportunity. He said, well, if we can do something on the front end with styrofoam, then you don't have to deal with it at your facility and worry about your air emissions. And I think that's great. So that's why I'm here to hopefully uh, educate the public, promote uh, styrofoam recycling or reuse, because um, we know it's uh, inherent in all the packing materials out there, um, and be happy to give tours to the public uh, at our facility on, on, on who we are and what we do. And I'll be happy to answer questions uh, and contribute throughout to today. you look uh, at the places that are doing it successfully we have some listed uh, on the slide here East Lake Ohio uh, there's an example in Columbus Ohio Phoenix recycling the city of Los Angeles uh, and then I was going to point something out about Europe and their whole uh, EU policy uh, essentially it boils down to if there is a will there is a way in other words uh, getting the community uh, to support the recycling will ultimately lead to the successful recycling of the product. And that's really what's important here because the benefits are not only economic but also obviously social benefits. One of the things uh, that's difficult, uh, you know, and I'm looking at it from the point of view of an economist, so I'm going to be very skeptical and say, well, you know, you'll hear that, you know, can you do it profitably? The answer is yes, you can. Now, the examples. Let me just uh, go through these. I'll take you through East Lake first. Uh, this is a facility that is operated by Buckeye Industries. And Buckeye Industries has four locations. This is Metropolitan Cleveland. They do 8 million pounds of styrofoam recycled annually. Uh, I was speaking to the plant manager. There were 50 people who worked there in that organization. So again, ask yourself, is it profitable? Of course it is. It provides jobs. It generates revenue. Phoenix Recycling, which I wanted to point this out because it's not really all that far from Cleveland, but this is another facility that successfully recycles styrofoam. And in fact, they've been doing it since they do recycle all plastics for 30 years. Los Angeles, again, here's a metropolitan area that is very large. And because of the initiative of people there, they had developed the technology, the machines that compress the styrofoam and shred it. And they started a public initiative there which eventually led to the city of Los Angeles uh, taking in styrofoam as a recyclable material. And they've been doing so successfully now for 
about 15 years. What has happened, and this has all happened with the increase in the price of oil since styrofoam is a petroleum-based product, when the price of oil increases, the price of polymers also increases. When the price goes up, it stabilizes the market. Uh, prior to the last, what, 10 years or so, I would say, you would find uh, massive increases in the amount of styrofoam, and then suddenly there would be a massive drop in the price. It was very unstable, and then very hard to uh, recycle something like that because there's really nothing you can count on. Today, uh, now that secondary markets have been emerging, uh, there's some stability to the price. It generally varies, as I said, between 35 cents and up to 46 cents a pound in the spot market. The spot market is the options market. It, it is uh, governed by contract relationships. And what we're beginning to see now is the emerging markets. Now we see crown molding, we see it in construction, in insulation, and um, I'm not sure if Miriam wants me to show you these products here, but this is from uh, a gentleman we have contacted out in Iowa, and he has a company called Instyro, and he makes styrofoam in different types of granules and small uh, pellets. And uh, well, my point is, we'll get to that a little later, that what is emerging is a market for things like uh, putting it in as a filler in cement, uh, using it in insulation, uh, you can get tax credits for that now. And there is, in other words, uh, an incentivization of the market, which hasn't uh, merged except recently, again, because of the price of oil. Now the price of oil, again, taking it from the point of view of an economist, we have to ask ourselves, is it going to remain profitable in the future? And the price of oil is expected to stabilize for a while and then even go down a little bit in the next five years. But long term, generally speaking, no, it's going to continue going up with the growth of the developing countries and emerging countries like China, India, and Southeast Asia. So all of these factors taken together, uh, they actually paint a very favorable picture for us and it is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, economically. Our associates for years are be, are, have been saying, you know, why are you throwing this away? And, and all of a sudden they see that we're really focused on it and we're, and we're driving that change. And what it's done in the stores from a morale standpoint and just creating the excitement. You know, we had to identify each one of those waste streams and start looking for solutions. Uh, styrofoam is one that, that we just didn't feel like we had an opportunity. We didn't spend a lot of time with it. And in the background, Terry was just consistently looking for, uh, for a solution, and he was able to come up with one. Uh, styrofoam's a whole different game because we're not just uh, sending it to our brokers to, to, to broker for us as a commodity. It has a specific trace through the supply chain, so we're not paying any addition for it to, to, to ride because the truck's already going, and we just fill that up. Then when it gets to the return center, they take it, set it aside, and the adult center, work center, comes and picks it up, and they take it to process that through the extractor to take the air out of the, the styrofoam. And then we have a supplier that once it goes from uh, a, a full pallet down to a little six by six block, they come and pick it up, and they take it, and they're processing it back into their product, which is photo frames. So it, it is a unique story that, that it has so many touch points, and, and again, it's, it's, it's good for that community. One of the challenges by Mike Duke was to incorporate this into our everyday business, just make it part of what we do every day. And, and I think the further down the road we get in sustainability, it just becomes a natural part of what we do, whether we're uh, building a new store or delivering trucks. You know, it just be, everybody's looking at the sustainability value. We're really interested today in talking about different ways that we can treat secondary use styrofoam as a cash commodity, essentially. 
and how can we harness some resources here locally to stimulating the secondary market in our area. Um, you know, we've, we've got numerous methods out there, but there really is no national body that is applying an industry standard to how this should be done in the most uh, profitable but also environmentally ethical way possible. So if you look at something like the USGBC and what they've done with the LEED certification program, they've created a standard and a toolkit so that companies can say, I want to do green construction and everything that that means. And there's an easy resource for people that are interested in getting involved. We'd like to create something similar in the styrofoam re recycling space. It's really going to hinge on partnerships between different community entities. Uh, like we saw in the video, you have big box stores like Walmart that have already endeavored to explore this area. But I think what that video did not tell you is that when they're shipping off that secondary product, it's going to China. It's bypassing our local market entirely. So the U.S. is not benefiting right now from that opportunity. Our organization is different because we're looking to address it locally, but really there's no compelling business case right now that can prompt a, a lawmaker or a business person to say, I need to get in there and start doing this. Um, and we recognize that that's one of the biggest challenges we face right now is not having data that has been harnessed and polished into a nice coherent business case. For that reason, one of the primary missions of Miriam's effort here is going to be grant stewardship and taking available funds from government, from b businesses, and from private donors, uh, and then giving that money to the institutions of higher education and the nonprofits that are already researching so that we can get the best and the brightest minds in the country working to solve this problem. And then this organization is going to also work with government and business to make sure that there's a real incentive to start doing this. So how can we distill the, the business case for the recycling of styrofoam and the reuse of uh, styrofoam into something that creates incentive? Um, and then it's on you know folks in, in this room, the business leaders, the community leaders, the um, the educators to get that message out there. So what we want to do is empower those people who are positioned to be ambassadors to get out there and start advocating. And then finally, I think the brokering of relationships. Again, there's a vacuum here nationally for leadership that uh, we're positioned to possibly fill. And we just want to see all the entities come together um, and really distill the business case out and then what resources need to be put in place to make it possible to execute.